Welcome to Living the Smarter Science of Slim, where we provide a scientifically proven lifestyle for long-term health and fat loss by eating more and exercising less, but smarter. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor back with another bonus Smarter Science of Slim podcast. Very, very excited about today's show because we have Jill Escher with us who is going to share a subject which is becoming more and more popular, not not because it's a good thing, but it's becoming more and more common in an area that I have very little expertise in, but I know a lot of you listeners are very, very interested in, and that's a subject of autism. And Jill is really an awesome individual to speak with about this because not only is she familiar with the nutritional side of things because she is the author of the, the wonderful book, The Farewell uh, Club for Permachub, as well as a big advocate of ending sugar addiction, which we're all fans of ending as well. She's also a former lawyer, a business owner, and she is the parent of two children with autism. And I have a special respect for her because she, like me, is a huge science geek and loves to just spend her spare, uh, her vast amount of spare time reading everything she can and talking with the the researchers about autism and what we can do to help out with it. So Jill, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me and uh, happy Autism Awareness Month. Um, I'm glad we get to touch on this subject in April. Woohoo! Absolutely. Well, Jill, let's let's just dig right into it. Uh, I mean, obviously with two children who, who have this condition, why you're interested is quite clear, but can, can you tell me really, I mean, obviously there, you're, there, are, there are quite a few people in the world that suffer from this condition and and you are the only Jill Escher. So what what made you take that that next step? Well, um, for several years, I've been a very active autism science philanthropist, and that means that I'm heavily involved in um, funding and also kind of coordinating and championing um, autism research. Now, autism, what does autism have anything to do with Smarter Science of Slim? <laughs> Like there must be a connection and, (laughs) you know, um, we will get there. I want to promise your listeners that, um, that we will get to connections between this crazy epidemic of really horrific neurodevelopmental disability that we're seeing with our kids. And I think there is, it's subtle, but I think there is actually a connection between what's happening with overall global human health and nutrition and really this catastrophe that's happening in the younger generation. Um, it's not an obvious connection, but, um, but we'll go over that. And um, autism, I, I'm sure your listeners know, has increased explosively in the last two decades. It used to be a very rare disorder, um, really on the lines of one in 10,000 people. The latest numbers from the CDC peg it at one in 50 children. And that is gigantic. So what we have now are schools that never, ever, ever had had an autistic kid, no matter what label they used. They might now have two, three, or four, you know, autism classrooms. We have um, a growing number of young adults with autism who really have nowhere to go because we've never developed the capacity in terms of programs. We have an incredible demand on our healthcare system for therapies and interventions for these people, whereas there was never much of a demand before. They didn't exist. I mean, some people say, oh, it's better capture. It's better diagnosis. And that's really not true. What's going on there is actually a developmental change in this generation. Their um, neurodevelopment has been compromised, at least a good portion of them, has been compromised in some way. And the question is, what is happening to our kids? Why is it that when I grew up in West LA, I had never heard of autism. I never met anyone with autism. It was crazy for me to even think of somebody who just, you know, couldn't talk and couldn't play and socialize and couldn't function, you know, for no apparent reason, right? What there's no genetic disability. They didn't have trauma at birth. This didn't exist. But all of a sudden, I look around my community and they're everywhere, including my two children. What happened, Jonathan? Why do we have this catastrophic tidal wave? of disability. By the way, um, this is not a small disability. Some people say, oh, you know, a lot of autism is mild. 
there's no such thing as mild autism. If you're autistic, it by definition, you have a very substantial impairment, which prevents you from living, you know, a, a normal life. So what is happening to our kids' brains? And this is something that has been preoccupying, you know, thousands of scientists and hundreds of thousands of parents in this country for a long time because we can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't figure out what's going on. And um, I, in my position um, as a champion of autism science, have been working on a number of projects really to try to, to figure out what is going on. And I want to tell you, um, I think we're getting closer and closer. I think we are at the point where we're beginning to understand why our kids are suffering so tremendously. And I think it's a number of things, but it primarily has to do with certain prenatal exposures that have risen in prevalence within the last, you know, 50 years or so. Okay, so what are these things? Let me just, I'm going to cut to the chase. There's a really, really long story that could I could preamble this with, but I'm going to cut to the chase, and I'm going to talk about three of them. Okay, the third one is going to be the most important. Right, okay, so, all right. So <laughs> one is, <laughs> one is, um, the increase in the use of prenatal medications, and that includes antidepressant drugs. Now, um, antidepressants, SSRIs, were introduced in the 1980s, and their, and their use has grown enormously during that time, especially among women of childbearing age. And animal studies and human cohort studies have both shown that fetal brain exposure to these SSRI antidepressant drugs um, impairs normal developmental process of the brain. And that can result, of course, not always, but that can result in lifelong um, either subtle or moderate or very severe um, neurodevelopmental impairment, including autism. So um, we're going to get back to SSRIs because I think the reason so many people are on SSRIs, Jonathan, why are so many people on, on SSRIs, Jonathan? Well, I would say, Jill, that it has to do with an insane pattern of eating. <laughs> I think you're right. Yay! I think that. <laughs> Jonathan, I think that, you know, the way that people are eating is a very pro depressant um, a way of eating. And this has had huge impacts on the rates of depression and how we're treating depression. And the failure of the medical establishment to recognize the triggers, the actual you know, biochemical triggers for depression, which include this insane diet that you talk so well about. So well, that's and, one thing. And, well, and Jill, and just, I certainly do not want to cut you off from getting to the other two, but I, I just really quickly wanted to pause. And this is such a wonderful example of how, so there, there's kind of a one-two punch going on here. Correct me if I... If, if I'm taking this too far, but okay. Step number one is we're, we're, we go insane because we've been given improper information and that makes us feel depressed. And that's certainly not good in the first place. That in and of itself, no good. Uh, but then we take medication, which in and of itself then causes generational problems and, and, and we're not cured of depression. We're just now in a fog when all of this could have been avoided, not only in ourselves, but in our children, if, if we, we attack the source of the problem, not just treating the symptoms, and that is improper nutrition. You're hitting the nail on the head. <laughs> so like, what happens to a woman? Think about this. This is very, very common. Let's say she's about 20. She's on a low-fat diet. I mean, my God, anyone on a low-fat diet is going to be depressed, let's face it. She's eating processed food. She's eating sugar. She's eating sugar substitutes. All of those are powerful depressants, right? And um, then she goes on the pill, mm -hmm. right? She takes, you know, oral contraceptive drugs. And that is also a depressant. So she feels like crap. She goes to the doctor. The doctor following, you know, the, the pharmaceutically, you know, guided standard of care um, prescribes her an SSRI drug, you know, like Prozac, Paxil, you know, all those. And, um, and then it becomes worse because these things are addictive. 
So she she doesn't go off them. The doctor certainly never stops the prescription. The doctor keeps filling the prescription. She becomes addicted or dependent on them. She gets pregnant, and then the doctor advises her, you know, stay on the medication. It's safer for you to stay on the medication, you know, than to go off it at this point. Okay, it's insanity. It's the definition of a world gone completely mad, you know, that all of this could have been avoided, you know, and... Um, it's just one thing on top of another that leads, unfortunately, in the next generation to, you know, sometimes a quite catastrophic result. So, and Jill, it really um, shines, a, well, just really quickly, it also, it really shines a light on the complete, uh, let's, let's, I'm just going to say it, the complete ignorance of this. The body is just this mathematical equation and clearly you just eat less and everything's good, right? And like, just take some drugs and like, what's the problem? And hey, it's uh, when we when we start uh, uh, not appreciating just how beautifully complex our body is and how sensitive we need to be and, and how you taking a pill, I always say there is no such thing as side effects. There's just effects. And when you start putting things in your body that you, we don't even really understand, and let's be clear, with a lot of these pharmaceuticals, we don't really understand them. They're brand new. By definition, we can't understand yes. the long-term impacts of them because they haven't existed in the long term. Lettuce has. Spinach has. Those things have <laughs> been around for a long time. We do understand what they do to the body. So I'm sorry to distract. Second item. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. You're right. And before I leave SSRIs, I do want to say, um, if anybody's interested in this, um, there's a wonderful doctor. He's based in Boston. Um, his name is Adam Urato, U-R-A-T-O. Just Google, you know, Urato antidepressants, pregnancy, something like that. And some of his writings will pop up. He He explains in far better detail than I ever could what the risks are. Um, of taking these drugs. And you never hear these risks from your doctor. So look him up. Okay. So uh, that's antidepressants. Okay. Let's go to the next thing that actually ties into nutrition. And that is fertility. So what is another cause of autism? And one is, and really people don't talk about this. Most people don't know about it, but it's assisted fertility treatment. Um, you know, usually IVF, but not always IVF, which is in vitro fertilization. And what happens? Why is assisted fertility related to autism in some way? And that's because of a molecular or set of molecular mechanisms called epigenetics. Have you heard of that, Jonathan? I love epigenetics, and, and I did some research on it for the, the upcoming uh, book, the, the Calorie Myth. Don't go as deep as I would have liked to, but it is a emerging and super fascinating area. I focused mostly on how the uterine, how you know, hormonally clogged slash diabetic slash insulin leptin resistance uterine environment affects the fetus, and that is shocking and scary. So I can only imagine what we're gonna talk about here is also shocking and scary. Yeah, yeah. Actually, well, let's come back to that 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 subject of the the insulin <laughs> clogged uterine environment. But um, but yeah, um, fertility um, treatments interfere with what is called the epigenetic programming of the early embryo, and also the the gametes that create that embryo. Okay, so what is epigenetics? Everyone listening to this, I assume, knows what genetics are. We have a genome. We have all these chromosomes, right? And they have a bunch of genes, and those genes code for certain proteins that create our body, right? But what controls the genes? On top of the genes, there are millions and millions, countless millions of these tiny chemical switches that we refer to as epigenetics. And while, we, while it's kind of hard to mutate our genome, that takes a lot of effort, it doesn't take as nearly as much effort to screw around with all of these little epigenetic switches that tell our genome what to do. All right. So let's say you're a tiny little egg, <laughs> right? And some chemical comes along, right? Well, that chemical might not mutate the genes within the egg, um, but it might perturb the epigenetic programming. And that's what's happening with assisted fertility. So um, here are a couple of examples. Um, very often, um, the fertility clinics will use something called ovulation induction, and they'll use a drug usually called Clomid. And what that drug does is it forces the 
uh, the egg, the the ovum, um, you know, to ovulate prematurely, and um, and that in itself can disturb um, the the epigenetics of the egg. The second thing that can happen is that with in vitro fertilization, you might take a, a very early fertilized embryo and put it in some dish in some gooey media, <laughs> you know, made of God knows what. And you're culturing this tiny, tiny, little tiny multicellular, you know, tiny embryo thing in this gooey mush. Well, this gooey mush of this Petri dish can also perturb the epigenetics of that tiny little embryo. And an, another thing that can happen is the physical manipulation of sperm, pardon the, the S word here, but um, what happens in fertility treatment sometimes is the physical manipulation of sperm, sometimes even putting it um, in, directly into the egg. And all of those things can disturb this incredibly delicate and vulnerable epigenetic programming. Now, when that epigenetic pro programming goes wrong, it can have lifelong neurodevelopmental impacts on the child. And that's why you see elevated rates of autism, but also other neurological disorders with, um, with assisted fertility kids. Now, let's go back, Jonathan, just as we did with SSRIs. Why are people you know, flocking? Why, there's so much infertility in this country. Why are people flocking to fertility clinics? Why can't they conceive children in a normal way? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons, right? Some of them are physical. Some of them have to do with age. But a lot of the time we have men who are subfertile because they are failing to produce enough sperm. Their sperm are not healthy. Or, and or we have women who are failing to cycle regularly or who have you know, altered or adulterated their natural hormonal environment in such a way that they cannot conceive or carry a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying all of this relates to nutrition. It, there are many factors here, especially our endocrine disrupting chemical environment is a huge factor. But I firmly believe that um, nutrition is playing a big role, especially the hyperinsulinemia, which comes from eating too many fill in the blank. Insane starches and sweets. Insane starches and sweets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you're really, you're scoring high today. Man. Uh, excellent. Two for two. <laughs> yeah, two for two. So how can you promote fertility without resorting to this toxic chemical intervention, which is unfortunately personally used um, in America today? And I think you know, one thing you can do, not that it's foolproof, um, is definitely get onto a diet that normalizes your hormonal environment and optimizes the um, the the environment you know for conception and for carrying that fetus. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, having read you know I don't know five billion <laughs> <laughs> you know our articles relating to the subject. Um, is through the sort of ancestral diet that, that you advocate, Jonathan. It's um, very much removing the modern foods, removing the processed foods, especially removing the sugars, um, getting over sugar addiction, which of course, you know, billions and millions and millions of us have, um, and really normalizing your environment to be hospitable to new life. Um, Again, not foolproof by any means, but hugely helpful to a lot of people. And, you know, you can't imagine how many people I've talked to who have gone through IVF. And before they were on IVF, they were often on um, uh, low-fat diets. Well, I, I, you know, a low-fat diet, a high-carb diet, I'm not going to go into the science of it. It'll put everyone to sleep. But you just don't want to have your body going through those crazy insulin cycles, which therefore have impacts on your sex hormone cycles. So um, you see, there's a connection. There's a connection also between nutrition and IVF, which has a connection to autism. Well, and it even it, it, it's this overriding pattern we even saw in the first factor you mentioned, which is we 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 all have this tool set available to us, and that is 
whole nutrient dense foods. It's available to all of us. You don't need a prescription. You don't need a PhD. You don't even need insurance to access it. And it, however, however, if, if we're not empowered with the information to make the proper decision when it comes to our nutritions, and then we start involving these 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 chemical and the, the these manipula almost like this Tower of Babel type approach to use a biblical reference, right? Where we try mm-hmm. to build that tower to the sky and we try to override and outsmart this our body. Generally, when we try to do that, it doesn't work as well. And I'm not I'm not I'm not here in any way, shape, or form criticizing modern medicine. Obviously, there are some miraculous like emergency room care. There's no better time to have been in a car accident than modern day, right? Because our ability to treat these yep. these immediate diseases is is phenomenal, but it's these chronic, subtle things which which in mm-hmm. fact like a good diet ain't going to help you when, when you get in a car accident. But it's these mm-hmm. it's actually these conditions that are lifestyle related, which it seems like so often our attempt to to bypass and say, well, you can still achieve the end result even with improper nutrition actually ends up biting us in the butt. That's so true. That's, it's very, very true. And, um, the only other thing I want to say about IVF and infertility is we have an epidemic of something called, I don't know if you've talked about it on your show, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Have you talked about it at all? I haven't talked about it on the show. Definitely has come up actually quite frequently in the Smarter Science of Slim support group. Oh, okay. Well, that's one of the the, the leading causes of female infertility. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to go into the details of PCOS, but um, the med- in the medical world, the first line treatment of PCOS is contraceptive pills. But in reality, of course, using contraceptive pills does nothing to address the root cause of the problem. And often what really has to be done is a very low-carb, high-fat diet to try to get um, you know, the hormones back in balance. Not that it's easy. It's not. But um, you know, it's just another example. Like you said, like, you know, building, we, we prescribe them pills. We're building the Tower of Babel. You know, instead of looking at what's what's the root cause here, how can we fix this, you know, in, in a way that that works with what nature intended? So um, big, big, big issues there. And um, I don't know how much time we have left. I can go into number three. Well, we, oh, you said number three right. is is the biggest and the best. So we've got to go it's to number three. the biggest <laughs> and the best. It's the scoop of the century, man. Okay, let's go to number three. So this is primarily, not, but not exclusively, what I've been working on. And here's the thing. In the 1950s, 60s, and into the 70s, there was something that happened in America that almost no one knows about, but you're the Nurzel. <laughs> uh, Jill, this and story is, is already starting to sound familiar. So I'm very, very, maybe there was, there was two, con- two things happening. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a movie. Uh, there was it. a hidden secret. <laughs> and okay, what, what happened, and this is a hidden history, what happened in those era, you know, kind of the Mad Men era, was something that um, I refer to as the prenatal pharmaceutical craze. And what happened was um, the medical profession had this idea that the placenta served as a barrier uh, between the fetus and the outside world and that only good and healthy things could possibly travel through the fetus, I mean, through the placenta to the fetus, right? At the same time, the chemical companies and the pharmaceutical companies were concocting an absolute explosion of new drugs. And the combination of these two factors led to what I believe is one of the greatest catastrophes ever in human history, which was the mass medicating of pregnant women in those decades. Now, what medications were sold to these women? What did they take? Why should we care? And why does it matter today? Right? This was decades ago. I will get there. (laughs) So um, the first wave of pharmaceuticals were sedatives and barbiturates, the the phenobarbitals that were intended. I mean, they were they were marketed for a number of reasons, usually, you know, to promote sleep, um, to decrease anxiety. They were used to even, you know, control um, vomiting, you know, and nausea. Um, The next wave of pharmaceuticals were the synthetic hormone drugs. These were fake estrogens, fake progesterones, and fake corticosteroids that were used primarily 
as anti-miscarriage agents. Now, they didn't really work. None of them worked. Uh, but they were given to millions and millions of women in the under the idea um, that these drugs would help prevent miscarriage. Now, there's one drug that's really well known. There were dozens and dozens of these fake hormone drugs, but one drug is really well known. Maybe you've heard of it. It was called DES, diethyl stilbestrol. Absolutely. Not, you have heard of it. I have. Okay. Uh, biggest drug disaster in history caused cancer and infertility in the exposed um, fetuses, among other many, many other problems. The next wave of drugs were these, um, uh, I'm speaking very, painting a very broad brush. They didn't really, you know, you know, exactly go in waves, but were the amphetamines and methamphetamines, which were prescribed um, for primarily for weight loss. <laughs> it was like, are you crazy? Yes, they used to prescribe pregnant women amphetamines and methamphetamines all the time. It was doctrine in the 50s and 60s that a pregnant woman couldn't in more than 20 pounds. So lots of women were given these drugs. Um, next, they were given anti-nausea drugs like dexedrine. Um, or there, there's still one that's widely used called Zofran. Um, and then, of course, things like um, Valium, um, the benzodiazepine drugs, which were other kind of you know sedatives, anti-anxiety drugs. Um, that were given. And there were, oh, of course, you know, diuretics, there were antihypertensives, there were, you know, stomach acid, you know, reflux types, type drugs, lots and lots and lots of drugs. I'm just kind of highlighting a few of the major categories for you. Okay. So you might be saying, why does this matter? Um, like all this heavy drug use, like when half the women were drugged or something like that, that happened in like the fifties and sixties and like into the seventies. But, um, why does it matter now? It matters now for a very important reason, because when a woman takes a drug, three generations are simultaneously exposed when a pregnant woman takes a drug. Okay, the woman, her fetus, and then the fetal germ cells. The germ cells refer to the sperm, the egg of that fetus, right? So we tend to, we all know that a pregnant woman has a fetus inside of her, but what we tend to, to not know is that that fetus itself is developing its sperm and egg or egg um, beginning in the first few weeks of pregnancy. Mm. All right. So um, a, what, maybe you've heard this in high school biology class. You know, a, a baby girl is born with all of her eggs. Those eggs develop, fully develop, except for like the last stage of meiosis, basically, within the first couple months of pregnancy. The, in the boy fetus, in the male, um, you have these protospermatozoa. Um, they develop something called spermatogonial stem cells. And then um, starting in puberty, the male you know, continuously develops sperm throughout their life. So the male and female are a little different. But in both cases, it is the early germ cells that develop in utero when that baby is just a tiny embryo. Okay, so why does this matter? We had lots and lots of women taking lots and lots of drugs, right, that exposed themselves, exposed their fetuses, and exposed the next generation, which is their grandchildren. Okay, this is a weird thing to wrap your head around. <laughs> even, even some of the top scientists are still trying to wrap their head around this. So if you're having trouble with this, like... Don't worry. It's, it's okay. It, it's going to become big news, you know, con, in a continual fashion. But um, the, grand, w the grandchildren that, you know, were kind of started, you know, kind of out in the, the 1980s of these women who were drugged in the 1950s, um, these are the offspring that resulted from these drugged germ cells. Mm. All right. We have a whole generation of kids who resulted from drugged germ cells. And what did these drugs do to those germ cells? Well, we don't know for sure because we haven't had research directly on point, but we can look at studies of similar compounds called endocrine disrupting chemicals. And what we see in these, there have been lots and lots of studies on this in the last five years. What we see is that these chemicals impair the germ cell development, resulting in in disease or behavioral abnormalities in that third generation, in the grandchild generation. Mm. 
Mm. Okay, it's weird. I wish we were visual. If it was visual, I would have a chart with three generations. You know, mom, <laughs> oh, kid. Oh, no, you're doing a good kid, job. You're doing a great kid. job. I'm following It's you. hard. Yeah. Now, this is, br- this is brand new stuff, so it's a little bit hard to explain. Um, that's what we see in animal models. And um, when it comes to, we talked about DES, which was that synthetic estrogen drug. Um, we now know in those human cohorts that there is this third generation effect because of the of the germ cells to that drug. Um, so that is what I believe and what other people believe is happening with autism. We are having basically a very delayed, you know, latent kind of time bomb um, effect of the prenatal pharmaceutical craze of the mid 20th century. And um, of course, as I said, autism is crazy heterogeneous. It comes in many shapes and sizes. There are many causes. I am not saying that the entire autism epidemic is attributable to this hidden history of prenatal pharmaceutical use, rampant pure prenatal pharmaceutical use. I'm not saying that at all. But a certain subset um, uh, mo- very likely is related to this. And um, we now finally have research underway that's looking directly at this subject. And um, hopefully next time we talk, Jonathan, I'll be able to talk about the results of those studies. Um, but um, but right now, all we have is the indirect evidence based on other chemicals that this is what may be happening. So those are the big three. And um, everyone says, you know, autism, it's genetic, right? Isn't there lots of evidence that it's genetic? Well, yeah, it's kind of genetic. We just have a whole bunch of stuff in the environment that's been screwing up our genes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, absolutely. Gene, gene, yeah. Genes and environment do not exist in, you know, pristine separation. The environment can dramatically affect our genes. Well, so, and, um, and that, yeah, Jill, that's the, the underlying, I mean, with, with all three of those factors, it, I, I see really an underlying trend and that is the further, like and in some ways, it's actually kind of good news. Like the further we move away from simply eating food, like if you it, it, and that's even the fifties. Like the fifties, we that was just not a good time period, right? Because that's when we started to move away from eating food too, right? That's when we were like, let's mass produce stuff. Let's let's create a bunch. You know, let's give corn subsidies and farm subsidies. Let's outsmart the body. Let's outsmart the last couple million years worth of evolution. Let's let's build that Tower of Babel. And sadly, it's it's. I mean, right? We've got this epidemic of autism because we cause neurological disruption. We've got this epidemic of obesity and diabetes because we cause metabolic disruption. Like, if nothing else, we all just need to take a big slice of humble pie and say, like, any time. Someone is going to try to intervene with this magical substance. I'll tell you what. There is one magical substance, and it's called nutrient-dense foods. And it's the only substance that has been proven for tens of thousands of generations to potentially be the, the number one mitigation against not only autism but a host of other conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're so right. And um you know, you have more wisdom than, you know, a thousand <laughs> researchers combined. I have to tell you, I was, I just, um, came back from a wonderful conference. Well, I co-sponsored it. So of course it was wonderful. <laughs> like, it was the Davis. best conference I've it ever been to. It was the best conference. Just the way it was, it was so ran, good. the way it was ran, I really like whoever organized <laughs> it did a spectacular job. A spectacular job. And you know what, if your <laughs> listeners are into autism geeking, um, we have a fabulous website for the fabulous conference. Um, just look up autism epigenetics, one word, autism epigenetics.org, and all the information from the conference can be found on that fabulous website. And, um, you know, during the website, we had the top scientists from around the world, you know, talking about these intergenerational issues and epigenetics. And, you know, one question that came up time and time and again is, well, gosh, I wonder what could confer protective effects, mm-hmm. right? And I'm sitting there and like, I don't, I don't want to turn this conference into a nutrition seminar. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, I have like Nobel Prize people there. So I have to kind of you know bite my tongue a little bit. But, um, you know, of course, what confers protective effects? 
It's exactly what you were talking about, Jonathan. It is, you know, the the real food nutrition, you know, and we talk about, you know, what are the meth, there's something called methyl donors um, that are important for, for this protective effect. Where do the methyl donors come from? Folate. Chicken liver, yep. kale, spinach, you know, real food. I mean, of course, people take in, it in prenatal vitamins as folic acid, but that's a synthetic substitute that I think is has its own concerns. I, I won't go there, so that would be a long discussion. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the protective effects come from natural nutrient-dense nutrition. Well, and in some ways, and, Julie, um, it's, in some ways it's so, it's, it's, it's shocking because it, it, it is, in some ways, it is, it's so simple. It's like we've been lied to with this myth of complexity. Like, let me give another example. Like, people are like, well, what, what could possibly help protect us from getting a disease? Well, what are some things that enable the body to be healthy? Well, sleeping, that, that's pretty good. Dr- drinking a lot of clean water, that's also pretty good. It's like, it's like we want to... It's like we we almost want it to be more complicated because I, maybe I don't know because literally like why how couldn't proper nutrition be helpful like it's is it just so obvious that we 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 we, we crave complexity what what do you think what's the psychology going on there you know I think you know just having worked with a lot of researchers over the years that. There is a need to be sciencey. <laughs> yeah, there's a, they have to add value somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we need to be sciencey, and there is a general fear that if they dabble in something like nutrition, they will be called quacky, and they will be marginalized, and their reputations will be diminished. So sad. These people are very prove- protective of their reputations. And there, there's a lot of fear of going out so off of the island of conventional wisdom. I mean, the, I, I love a lot of these people. I really do. I think a lot of them do incredible work. But um, you know, when it comes to an understanding of ancestral nutrition and something that's really basic and not super sciencey sounding, they tend to become afraid. Well, even Jill, even even the fact that we have to call it ancestral nutrition like it it is it is the normal way of eating like that's how mm-hmm. everybody ate up until we had these problems so so right. it's but but like we have to qualify it with oh, an ancestral way of it no it's it's eating food that's all we're talking about if you define food as that which you find in nature and and you define edible products as everything else all we're talking about is eating food, but even that, like we have to, we have to complicate it. We have to call it an ancestral this. And it, I think it's, yeah. it is because I, I work, you know, in engineering and it's true. It's like, there's gotta be, you gotta add value somehow. So if you can give fancy names and you can <laughs> build products, right. then you're adding value. I don't, it's kind of funny. Yeah. You got to justify your PhD, man. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I, I think that ultimately, um, a lot of this epigenetics mayhem, you know, that's contributing to the autism epidemic. I I, I think we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. I think people will realize that this is a a question of evolutionary biology. And these people know they are damn smart. And they know that evolutionary biology is driven by these very, you know, vulnerable, tiny molecular mechanisms. And that these novel synthetic chemicals are wreaking havoc on this process. So, you know, they're, they, they're not stupid. They, 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 they know they're kind of fixated on the molecular part instead of the big picture, but give them time. I, I'm pretty confident that, that we will, we will get there. Um, and also, you know, the big problem is in terms of clinical work, there's like no money to be made in, you know, having your clients eat, you know, paleo ish diet. And um, there's much more money to be made by giving them Clomid and, you know, doing a $20,000 round of IVF or whatever. I mean, it, that's just the way it is. They have an inherent conflict of interest. So, um, you know, people should, uh, you know, if they want to get fertility help or if they want to take SSRIs, you know, if they, they really have to be aware of what the real dangers are and that will help them make good decisions. Well, and Joe, so, um, in, it, well, yeah. in addition to having you on the show, because I so admire your work and your passion and, and the, the mission and drive you have to help others. I think this is such a great example of about how this, this, this sane 
lifestyle and, and proper nutrition and proper sleep and proper exercise is about so much more than what the scale says. Like it oh is, my God, yes. it, it, I mean, it, it's almost, and once that's so freeing though, like, like once we understand how deeply and for generations, like if for no other reason, do this for your grandkids. Like, think about that. Do this for mm-hmm. your grandkids. Like, you can leave a legacy just by eating food and a positive yeah. legacy. And you can leave a negative legacy if if you don't give your body the nutrition it needs. And that, if that's not motivating, Jill, I can't, can't imagine what is. Mm-hmm. Well, people, you know, are motivated by fitting into their, you know, size six jeans or, or whatever. And that's fine. That certainly motivated me when I, you know, got off sugar. But, oh, my God, the the downstream effects of eating fake food can be catastrophic. It's not just about aesthetics, people. I mean, this is serious, serious stuff. Um, and I do want to say just one more thing, because I have a feeling your listeners might be like, um, why does this weird lady have two autistic kids? Like she just went over like you know, all these causes. Like, do I know why I have autistic kids? Right. And I want to address that um, because it might shed some light on this whole space. So um, my kids, I, I, I'm an anti-pharmaceutical person. I never, I hardly even take Advil when I have a headache. You know, I just don't take drugs. I, uh, ne- I had no problems with fertility. My gestations were normal. My childbirths were normal. My kids were normal. They have no genetic defects. I don't have any autism in my family or any you know, mental illness in my family, you know, or my husband's family. You know, everything was normal, right? So why in the world would my kids be so very, very disabled? One is nonverbal. The other is partially verbal, but, but still quite non-functional. They're both beautiful, by the way. Why, why did this happen, Jonathan? Which, under, uh, behind which door <laughs> is the answer to my personal mystery? And the craziest thing that happened in uh, about two years ago is that I obtained my own prenatal records. I was born in 1965. I'm an old lady compared to you, Jonathan. And um, I am the only person on the planet, apparently, who has ever seen her own prenatal records. Um, this was a crazy fluke that I got these things. It was just um, a miracle. I have no other way to explain it. It was an absolute miracle. I got this prenatal record never having known that I was ever exposed to anything. Everyone, no one assumes that they were exposed to anything in utero, right? Well, it turns out that I had been um, very heavily exposed to a variety of synthetic hormone drugs. And, um, those were intended again for the prevention of miscarriage. They didn't actually work, but that's what they did in the sixties with crazy sixties. And this is what the doctors did. You know, um, my, my, I want to say for the record, you know, I, I don't blame my mother in any way, shape or form. She was one of millions of women you know, who was given, you know, crazy drugs in that period. And, uh, as today, you know, women did as they were told, if the doctor said it was safe, you did it. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, this was very innocently done, and um, I, I don't feel like I'm dragging a skeleton out of the closet. This stuff was widespread and um, really normal for the time. So what probably happened was those drugs interfered with the programming of, of my developing eggs. And so my eggs are, you know, have what's uh, you know, probably called these epigenetic impairments, which which led to the abnormalities in my children. Um, so yeah, it's crazy. Totally, it, I could spend three hours going over the story about how we all piece this together. It's the craziest thing ever. But um, but that's my personal story. And the only reason I'm different from any other autism parent is the miracle of my obtaining my records. If I didn't know, I, I, none of this would have come to light. And um, and yeah, I'm just this, I'm this wacky story. So that, that's my story. And, um, and I do want to say, I do have my own personal blog. If people want to learn more about pharmaceuticals and epigenetics and autism, it's called prenatal exposures. So one word, prenatal exposures.blogspot.com. 
And um, there you will see my rantings <laughs> <laughs> on this subject, but with useful rantings, extraordinarily useful <laughs> rantings. Um, and um, I think I have an email address on there if anybody has any, you know, questions. Everyone's now freaking out. What in the world was I exposed to in utero? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, well, Jill, and the other thing I want to call out here, and, and uh, another reason I wanted to have you on the show, is, is truly you are being the change you want to see in the world. One of my favorite quotes uh, from, from Gandhi uh, ever, and you are being that change. And, and I say that on multiple levels, right? We've even talked about the nutritional components here. And, and Jill, I, we didn't focus it uh, in this episode, folks, but you know, she, she kicked sugar addiction, and she has done amazing work. Uh, around sugar addiction and providing awesome tools to help end that. So, I mean, she she truly is attacking this from all angles and with love in her heart. And if you want to learn more about that aspect of her life, uh, you can certainly check her out at Jill Escher, and that's e s c h e r dot com. And of, I mean, the, she's got her book up there. Proceeds are going to charity. I mean, truly, Jill, uh, I salute you for what you're doing. It's it's quite amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. It's, it's so important. And, um, uh, if we could only get everyone to listen to Jonathan Baylor, <laughs> we'd get rid of, you know, many of the chronic diseases plaguing our country. So, um, tell all your friends, listen to Jonathan. Listen. <laughs> well, and, and while you're telling them, uh, that please tell them to also check out uh, Jill's work because it is fantastic as well. And and tell them too that we can all we can all be the change we want to see in the world. And again, I think that is just like the more noble, the more reasons we can give ourselves to make choices, which is in our society may not be the easiest choices to make. Uh, you know, we can and we can be motivated by the size of our genes, uh, but we can add to that list of motivation the lives of our children and the lives of our grandchildren as well. And Jill, that's uh, just why I wanted to have you on the show, one of many reasons, and I just think it's a, a profound message. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me this Autism Awareness Month, and I hope we'll talk again. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Jill and listeners. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Really shines a light on just how many reasons we truly have to honor our body and to pursue a healthy body, which will then automatically pursue a healthy weight on our behalf and for generations. So thank you again for joining us. And remember, eat more and exercise less, but do that smarter. Talk to you soon. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like the podcast and if there's other ways we can help you, please join us in the Smarter Science of Slim support group, which is freely available at the Smarter Science of Slim website, smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll find all kinds of free recipes and success stories and just all kinds of fun stuff like how to help your kids go sane and just great community content. And just one last thing before you go, if you wouldn't mind heading over to iTunes and up onto Amazon.com and leaving us a review and then going over to Facebook and liking us, we would hugely appreciate it. 